Well, hello and welcome, everyone. I'm Raj Kumar. I'm the president and editor-in-chief at DevX, and delighted to be with all of you who are joining us from all over the world to talk about one particular region that rightly deserves to be spotlighted today, and that is South Asia. We're here because the World Bank has just launched its South Asia Development Update, a report that gets a lot of attention for good reason in any time, but particularly now, because eyes are on South Asia uh, I think for very good reasons. It is the fastest growing region in the world. A lot of the world's hopes around achieving the sustainable development goals lie there, given the size of the population and the dramatic needs that remain, even as the economies uh, broadly are growing. And the need for energy transition is particularly acute in South Asia. So eyes are on South Asia in a big way. I think just a couple of days ago, the World Bank talked about slowing growth in East Asia, but South Asia is the focus. And we are here with a group of tremendous experts from inside the bank and outside to hear what this report tells us and what the implications are. Um, what can governments actually do at this point, given the realities the region is facing? Because a lot of what this World Bank report says, as we'll discuss during the conversation today, is that there is a big challenge and a big opportunity for governments, that right now a lot of focus is on what governments decide to do around their fiscal policy. And so we'll get into that a little bit and, and what it might mean for a region that could grow potentially faster, um, but can it grow in a way that's sustainable and that's green? And so we're gonna get into that, I think in a rich conversation today. And I just wanna mention who all we have here and then we'll, we'll begin with the first part of the conversation. So um, we'll be joined soon by Dushni Varakun, who is the Executive Director for the Institute of Policy Studies of Sri Lanka. Mustafa Izur Rahman, who's the Distinguished Fellow at the Center for Policy Dialogue in Bangladesh. And Franziska Onsorj, who is the World Bank Chief Economist for South Asia. We'll have a panel discussion and get into the meat and details of this report. But we're going to begin with sort of a fireside conversation um, between two people who know this region very well, and I'm excited to hear their discussion. We have Martin Razor, who's the World Bank's Vice President for South Asia, managing some $55 billion in a, in a portfolio across the region. And V. Ananta Nagaswaran, who's, of course, the Chief Economic Advisor to the Government of India. So we're going to hear from the two of them, and then we'll get into our panel conversation. So, Martin, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Raj uh, Kumar, for this uh, introduction. And you said quite a few things that I wanted to say by way of introduction, but I do want to start by welcoming uh, Ananta Nagaswaran, the Chief Economic Advisor to the Government of India, uh, to this chat and, and also the other panelists and very much look forward to what they will have to say. Raj, as you said, South Asia is expected to grow faster than any other region in 24-25. Uh, we predict 5.8% growth uh, this year and 5.6% growth next year for the region, uh, which is higher than, than anywhere else in the world. Yet, if you compare this to pre-pandemic trend rates of growth, it's actually lower than the region was growing pre-pandemic. So it says something about how low global growth is, that even South Asia that is growing faster than anybody else is not really quite at the levels uh, that it was pre-pandemic. And it's still short of the levels that uh, the region would need to grow to reach its aspirations. For example, India uh, wants to be a high income country by 2047, the 100th anniversary uh, of its, uh, of its uh, independence. And, and for that, it would have to grow closer to 8% than uh, to the current 6% um, or so. Um, yet our report suggests that there are big opportunities out there particularly in the clean energy transition to generate jobs, to cut pollution, uh, to reduce reliance on energy imports and overall increase economic resilience. Uh, and there may be uh, significant opportunities uh, related to the way global value chains are reshaping. So this is a moment uh, where, as you rightly pointed out, Raj, all eyes are on South Asia. Uh, can it be the world's next growth pole? Um, and so uh, in that context, let me start um, with uh, my first question uh, to you, Ananta. Um, against this background, what do you think uh, are India's prospects uh, in the short run? And where do you see the main risks uh, to this outlook? Thank you, Martin. And thank you to World Bank for inviting me to this conversation. Good to see you, Martin, virtually. I hope I'll see you in person in, uh, in Marrakesh. In about yes, indeed. 
in about a week or so. So I think India's prospects uh, for economic growth look good. Yes, you mentioned about the fact that 8% might be needed, but 6 plus is what is happening right now. But the global context has changed. When India was able to grow at 8 plus percent in the first decade of the millennium, export growth was a big contributor. World economy was uh, in a much healthier state. So if India can achieve 6.5% per annum on average, which I believe it can, uh, in the in the rest of the decade, that would be a very creditable achievement under the circumstances. And this I am saying based on the assumption that no further economic reforms take place at the union government level or at the state government level, and based on what has already been done in the last uh, eight to nine years. However, if on top of those reforms, we do have, let's say, more uh, reforms in the state government side on um, reforming the power sector, on uh, skilling the population, on reforming land laws and conversion of agriculture into non-agricultural use, et cetera. If all those things are addressed as well, along with the continued emphasis on ease of doing business, then I think uh, growth rates of around seven to seven and a half percent will be feasible. So those are the prospects. The main risks as I see them, I am, and I'll skip the near term risks coming from the oil price, the level of interest rates in the developed world and geopolitical fragmentation, etc. I'll focus on the medium term, which is also the topic of uh, your report, uh, the energy transition. I think uh, there is a lot of emphasis from the point of view of the West, justifiably so, on emission reduction. Whereas we need to also invest in adaptation and resilience, considering the emissions that are already out there over the last couple of centuries, given that the half-life of carbon in the atmosphere is 120 years. And, uh, and, and also, we need to make sure that economic growth does not suffer in this energy transition, because we don't see it as being anti-critical to the energy transition. We need economic growth because we need our own resource generation. We cannot depend on external capital for that would have a big, big impact on external balances and current account deficits, etc. So maintaining steady and moderate to above moderate economic growth is actually a big challenge, but it's also a big imperative to achieve energy transition over the medium term. And that is the biggest uh, challenge and risk that I see in the coming years. I'll stop here and uh, let you uh, come up with follow-up questions. Back to you, Martin. Thank you, Ananta. It's uh, interesting because the way we present this in the report, of course, what you just talked about is in terms of the opportunity. Uh, and what we point out is that uh, you know countries like India who have uh, you know high domestic savings rates and quite developed capital markets actually have an advantage in that they can mobilize a lot of the resources uh, that they need to finance the energy transition internally. And you rightly pointed out uh, that there are uh, macroeconomic uh, external balance questions associated with trying to finance it all from abroad. I think that's a point that that uh, sometimes in the discussion does not get uh, uh, as much as attention as it should. But but coming back to this question of the investment mm -hmm. opportunity, uh, mm -hmm. you know, people like Nick Stern have been arguing that this green transition um, is a huge uh, investment opportunity along the lines of big push theories of investment. Um, yet, uh, when you look at the drivers of investment in India over the last few years, uh, the public sector has played an important role. And the balance sheet of the public sector is constrained in, in how much further impulse it can give. So how do you turn this initial impulse, which has gone so much into infrastructure, which has provided a lot of dynamism to the Indian economy, how do you turn this into an impulse for more private investment? You talked a little bit about the reforms, but uh, if you could elaborate um, uh, on that, that would be great. Yeah, I think you're right that, first of all, it presents opportunities, no doubt. And I think the opportunities are definitely there. And uh, at, uh, in some cases, it could be a win-win. But we should also not trivialize or minimize or ignore the challenges, especially on the social dimensions, such as labor market adjustments, dislocation, disruptions, and the economic choices always involve trade-offs. It is very difficult for us to believe that there are no... Uh, uh, hurdles or risk factors 
because corner solutions are seldom feasible. So we need a constrained optimization and the constraints are going to come from the uh, labor market adjustments, availability of resources such as critical minerals and rare earths. And also, even with respect to renewable energy, we need uh, grid stability and storage technology to uh, improve, etc. Now, coming to the private sector, last decade, Indian private sector was repairing balance sheets because there was credit boom in the first decade. Both banks and the non-financial corporate sector were repairing balance sheets. And that is why the public sector had to take up the mantle of driving infrastructure investment, including on renewable energy, et cetera. But I believe now the private sector is ready and willing to invest and capable of doing so. Balance sheets are in good shape. Retained profits or internal resource generation is in good shape. And the private corporate sector is also committed to uh, helping the country along in the energy transition path. So it was the balance sheet issues that made the public sector, rightly so, take up the mantle of driving growth and driving investments in general, not just a regular infrastructure, but also a climate compatible infrastructure. But this decade, now that the pandemic and other one-off shocks are hopefully behind us, the private sector will pick up the baton from the public sector with better balance sheets and banks are willing to lend as well as we are seeing in the credit data. So that is why I'm confident that uh, economic growth this decade will be driven as opposed to the last decade by capital formation in the private sector and also thanks to the productivity improvements caused by India's um, investments in the digital public infrastructure. Back to you. Thank you very much, Ananta. So this handover from the public to the private sector, both from, a, right. from an economic cycle point of view, but also reflecting the, the opportunities, um, I think is an important part of what we see in the South Asia region, not just for India, but for other uh, countries as well that have relied so much on, on the public sector driving things, and in some cases, indeed, crowding the private sector out. So this is, a, this is a, 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 an optimistic, um, uh, perspective that you're providing. Um, I did want to uh, emphasize the point that you made earlier about the importance that uh, um, that resilience and climate adaptation plays for South Asia. I think uh, an area where we will need to see uh, public mm -hmm. the public sector investing and where we will need to see uh, new innovative ways of combining public and private uh, balance sheets is going to be climate adaptation and uh, a topic of significant uh, interest for us and and Francisca uh, in a year's time or so uh, will probably return with a report that pays more attention to that, uh, and we look forward to uh, to discussing it with with you at that time. Um, but I did um, want to uh, talk a little bit more about the question of public balance sheets and debt uh, because this is something that we have seen in the region. Um, the the South Asia region, and I'm not talking specifically about India, but but about the region as a whole. And, and of course, India uh, is uh, a creditor to some of your neighboring countries, so that I'm sure this is something you're following very closely. Uh, the South Asia region uh, has the highest uh, level of public uh, debt to GDP of uh, any of the emerging market regions that we track. Um, it has a, a, a country in an active debt restructuring uh, process in, in Sri Lanka. Uh, it has a number of other countries that are uh, classified as being at risk of falling into debt distress. Um, so what is your sense? What are the key uh, policy priorities for governments to navigate in what is a really treacherous and difficult international environment? How do you navigate it, given that you're entering this period in the global economy with such a high level of debt? What can you do? Martin, that's a very uh, important question, and I wish there were easy answers. Uh, because if they were, they would have been pursued already. I think the problem is that, as, as your report points out, countries face lower growth post-pandemic recovery is uneven. They have been saddled with debt, both due to the fiscal stimulus they had to provide and due to denominator shrinking, uh, the GDP numbers. And on top of that, now they have to maintain growth. Frankly, uh, so there are, uh, we have to prioritize and countries have to prioritize. And that is where 
technical inputs and suggestions from international organizations in helping countries sequence their priorities right now will be extremely helpful because there are no easy or right answers. Context matters. And, and the advice and the conversation should be very open and frank and uh, discuss all pros and cons and ultimately choose the ones that seem to be the least damaging. In which case, my personal answer would be that countries do have to prioritize economic growth because that is what will help them bring their debt back to sustainable levels and also generate confidence in the public or in the economy, in the leadership, and that in turn will become a virtuous cycle. If we now prioritize on austerity or focus on energy transition by making fossil fuels more expensive, and then uh, making people more unhappy because that is the case even in advanced nations. When you are asked to pay, people's support for climate transition policies dropped considerably. And uh, the levels of disposable income in the developing countries is even less. And therefore, right now, the prioritization should be on restoring economic growth as far as possible and providing support and relief by international organizations and developed countries for them to come back to growth. And that is what will also provide social, economic stability and confidence in the system, and which will then become a virtuous cycle. And later on, then countries can concentrate on uh, paying back their debt, bringing it to sustainable levels, and also have resources to invest in energy transition. This is my, uh, this, is, this is how I would be looking at the situation. Back to you. Yeah, that's interesting. I think, um, you know, uh, India has uh, passed the budget uh, for for uh, this year, uh, this coming year, which is an unusual budget, given that it's a, a country that that uh, is entering into a, a, a general election cycle, uh, which emphasized capital spending. So that's very much linked to your uh, recommendation that countries should focus on economic growth. Of course, India um, has given itself the room uh, through the GST reform and other reforms in the past that generated the revenue that gives it a bit more flexibility than some of the other countries. I, we would argue, and we do that in the report, uh, that for a number of, of the countries in the region, really there's no alternative than to raise yeah. revenues. Um, and, and I'm sure we'll hear uh, uh, more about that from, from some of our panelists uh, going forward. Um, I did want to ask you a final question in the three minutes that I that I'm indicated we have remaining for our conversation, okay. uh, which is, uh, you know, how much potential do you see uh, in efficiency gains in the delivery of services? Uh, one of the experiences that India's had during the pandemic is uh, the use of digital technology to reach vast uh, swathes of the population much more efficiently and quickly through cash transfers. Um, we've seen digital medicine, we've seen online education, uh, we've seen the recent G20 agreement on the, on the, on the uh, you know, uh, digital public infrastructure. Um, is this uh, a potential additional uh, driver of, of al allowing governments with constrained balance sheets to deliver services more effectively? What can one learn from India's experience? Oh, thank you, Martin. I think my answer to your previous question was more about other developing countries in the region, not just not not particularly with relevance to India, because India's situation, as you pointed out, is somewhat better and significantly so. Uh, uh, and India's nominal GDP growth is much higher than the cost of capital it, it has. And India's debt ratio compared to 2005, for example, pre-2008 crisis and 2021 post-pandemic, had hardly changed so it is not so my answer was more with respect to other countries in the region uh, as to as to prioritizing economic growth now coming back to your last question yes I do see the digital public infrastructure and delivery of services playing a very big role in lifting the potential growth. One is the balance sheet improvement and the second driver of the incremental growth over and above the 6% that organizations such as yours mentioned as the possible trend growth, and I'm talking about six and a half percent. Roughly the additional 50 basis point comes from the fact that capital formation in the private sector is going to improve, and another quarter percentage point coming from the productivity gains coming through formalization of the economy, 
financial inclusion and better market access for small, micro and medium enterprises that the digital infrastructure provides, which they cannot do if they have to only establish physical presence and then try to market themselves. Then they will be circumscribed by their size. The digital technology enables them to overcome this, uh, this uh, constraints on size that physical locations and the physical businesses uh, uh, present them with. And that is why I feel that going forward, uh, uh, India's economic growth will be better served because of the investments made in the uh, digital public infrastructure. Now, it has not been quantified yet, and it is difficult to do so, but we are working on it as to how much it would contribute uh, incrementally to India's potential GDP growth. Now, conservatively, I'm expecting that to be somewhere between 25 to 30 basis points, with another 25 to 30 basis points coming from the uh, enhanced capital formation this decade compared to last decade. Back to you. Thank you very much. So, so we end uh, we end on an optimistic note uh, regarding the opportunities of the digital transformation. Um, I think we have a uh, we have a balanced picture regarding the opportunities of the energy transition. Uh, we outlined some of those opportunities in the report. Uh, to put it in a very crude form, uh, I think you could say that the cheapest energy is the one you don't need to consume because you're more energy efficient. Uh, and that offers a lot of opportunities, even just through uh, the the uh, the adoption of modern technologies uh, that uh, that are not entirely or or dependent on on price mechanisms like the ones you described. Um, I think we uh, we do have a, a clouded outlook uh, fiscally for uh, a lot of the uh, rest of the region, and something that needs uh, to be addressed with some urgency. Um, and I hope that the panelists. Uh, that uh, come after us, uh, Ananta, uh, will delve a little bit more deeply into those questions of the challenges. But thank you very much. And indeed, looking forward to seeing you in Marrakesh. And after Marrakesh, I'm coming to Delhi. So looking forward to okay. seeing you. That's good. I look forward, um, look forward to that. Yeah. Thank you so much, Raj. Back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Ananta. That was a fantastic discussion. And we will take up that call to action, Martin, and get into some of the, the threads that you began to pull on there in that really interesting discussion. So maybe Francisca, I can start with you. As I mentioned, you're the chief economist for the South Asia region at the World Bank. Um, and I guess one of the issues Ananta and Martin got into a bit there is this idea that a lot of the growth in India in particular, and we can talk about the region as a whole, but of course there's quite a bit of diversity. We've got a couple of countries with less than 2% GDP growth. We can talk about the situation in Sri Lanka, which is quite different than others. But in, in general, your report talks about growth, and we heard that in the conversation. There's been a lot of growth. It might be slowing, but it's the highest in the world. But it sounds like a lot of that growth was driven through public sector investment over the last decade. And the key issue here, which Ananta was very forceful on, is that's going to shift. We're going to get private sector investment now because we know it's not sustainable to simply have the government funding this kind of investment to drive that growth. Is that a shift that you see happening or is that a risk to the growth picture that you outline in your update? Thank you, Raj. Uh, so the region is growing at almost 6%, whereas all the other regions are growing somewhere between 2 and 5%. And the relative strength this particular year, this year and the next couple of years, has, well, it has some fundamental factors, but it also has some cyclical factors that are causing this, this recovery. First, potential growth in the region is high. Ananta has already touched on this. The investment prospects are good. The other thing that the region has is a young and growing workforce. That will, for the next decade or so, that will definitely be a growth driver. The question is, can it be leveraged into faster growth, all this potential? But there are two other reasons, reasons, cyclical reasons, why the region is doing better than others. First, the region is much more closed than other regions, and I'm happy to go back to it. Uh, so it doesn't get hit so much by these global shocks that are currently affecting the global economy. And the second reason is that uh, several crisis-affected countries, I know Mustafa is here, you will talk about this more, but several of these are rebounding now. Things are looking better. So that is one of the reasons, that those are kind of the three drivers of the relative strength of this region compared to others. Now, on your question, what can be done to accelerate growth and make sure that this this private sector, that there's this handoff from public sector to private sector. Just two things to bear in mind. Ananta spoke about India. He could have just as well spoken about the other countries. 
for every country for which we got data on private, private investment, for all of them, private investment growth over the last five years has been less than the private investment growth of pre-pandemic average, uh, less than the pre-pandemic average. So this private investment weakness is really in all the countries. It's a real challenge for the re region. Some countries, and not just India, there's four out of the eight, make up for it by having very strong public investment. But of course, with the current fiscal positions and with debt that high, exactly what was mentioned already will be a challenge. How can you sustain this? This cannot be sustained over a long term. So that then raises the question, how can you boost uh, private investment? And there, unfortunately, it becomes very difficult. There's no silver bullet. A whole number of things have to go right. The business climate has to be good. The financial system has to work and not just finance the government. It has to work to finance the private sector. Um, the, <laughs> private investment is also often encouraged by trade, by interacting with the rest of the world. And in two of these dimensions, the region actually falls short. First, the region has, I, I was really struck when I started working on this region, the region is really in many dimensions the most closed emerging market and developing country region of all. It's got trade costs that are averaging about 100, the tariff equivalent of about 140% compared to other, the rest of the other emerging markets, about 120%. It's really difficult to trade with this region. And this is not just because of tariffs that are higher than elsewhere. It's also just really hard to cross borders. It's, it, the logistics don't work very well. It's just really expensive to trade with this region internationally. And the second a uh, way in which the region is relatively close to the outside world is capital controls. They're much higher, both on inflows and on outflows in the region than outside, than in other countries. So by closing towards the rest of the world, it's an opportunity missed, an opportunity for technology transfers, for investments coming in. Um, and the third item, maybe the, 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 what was touched on already, another opportunity not yet missed, perhaps realized, is the energy transition. As we point out in the report how firms in the region have been enthusiastic adopters of very basic energy efficient technologies like LED lamps. What's missing is the adoption of advanced energy efficient technologies. And here there doesn't need to be a trade-off between growth and energy efficiency. We've, we've shown that firms that have improved their energy efficiency use those savings to expand employment, to create jobs. So there could be a win-win in, in, in this. Back to you. There, there could be, yeah. And of course, it does raise the implication that Anantha also described, which is some, some labor force shifts, which we can get into as well as we talk a little bit more about energy transition. But I do want to bring some of our other uh, panelists into the conversation. Uh, Dushni Verakun is with us. Uh, Dushni, you lead an Institute of Policy Studies in Sri Lanka. Um, a country that we've talked about has been has defaulted, has gone through some very serious fiscal challenges. Um, the conditions under which South Asia is operating now have changed quite a bit. Right, we are no longer in the zero interest rate environment. Interest rates are marching up all around the world. Um, we are also in a situation where oil is now ninety dollars a barrel, um, and this is a region that is largely an importer of energy. How did those two shifts in the macro circumstances of the region affect it. We heard from Francisca that these, these are typically more closed economies than elsewhere in the world, but nonetheless, these interest rate and energy price shocks ought to affect their growth prospects going forward. How do you see that playing out? Oh, thank you, Raj. Well, I, I um, think that, you know, the South Asian region is in some sense more vulnerable to the kinds of um, external shocks uh, that you mentioned. Um, for two reasons. One is that uh, I think it was mentioned we have uh, fairly weak fiscal positions across the region. Uh, and, and second, also uh, that uh, we have very sort of, you know, we don't have very resilient uh, export sectors far from, uh, you know, a diversified export um, uh, baskets. So we're not linked to global supply networks, etc. So the response to those kinds of um, crisis in that situation, I think many countries did manage to um, introduce reasonably, um, you know, macro 
uh, tools, allowing the exchange rate to absorb some of these um, shocks, and where possible, if the fiscal positions allowed it, to give some uh, additional um, social uh, protection, etc. Now, having said that, um, South Asia, and I think Francesca very correctly said, we are prone to embracing um, uh, protection uh, in, 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 in uh, not only as uh, short-term risk management tools, but also more in the medium to long term. Uh, and uh, some of our countries, and, and, and I um, place Sri Lanka as, as one of the countries that uh, rolled out uh, you know series of uh, import restrictions. Um, to me, I mean, at, the, at a point when your balance of payments position is um, extremely uh, under pressure, I think short-term import restrictions on, on certain non-essential consumer um, items and, and items like vehicle imports, etc. I think that's justifiable. But the, the risk is that these tend to kind of then mm, spread more widely um, uh, into other consumer imports as well as into intermediate imports. And that uh, also then has a downside impact uh, on our export competitiveness. So, you know, as, as a short term tool, yes, I, I think in certain conditions, uh, we can learn to live with it. But um, over the medium to long term, uh, import restrictions really should not be um, deployed. Right, it can create uh, kind of a vicious cycle. It is a vicious cycle. And I think that is, uh, you know, if we continue with that policy, we will not be able to um, improve our export performance. And, and that is uh, the only way that we can ensure that the region is less uh, vulnerable to similar risks um, in, the, in the future as well. So, you know, the policy prescriptions that was previously mentioned, I think were all well known, uh, well understood. The problem for South Asia really has been that we have not been able to push through a reform agenda uh, and, and sustain it. Um, we tend to see policy reversals with changes of government. Um, and, and that really is the problem here. How do we build cross-party political consensus on the need for certain crucial reforms and ensure that those are sustained even if um, there are changes of government every four or five years? Well, I think like most issues in global development, a lot comes down to political economy. And uh, as you say, these are challenging issues because you might start them as a short-term fix, but you end up creating a situation where there have to be winners and losers when you change policy. And that is politically really challenging. Um, but there seems like there are some opportunities here. We just briefly talked about energy and it seems like the energy transition could be a big opportunity for the region to, especially in an era of very high you know, energy prices to be able to generate clean energy domestically. And the other big opportunity, I wanna bring Mustafa Zir Rahman into the conversation on this point is around more of an opportunity to globalize. So in the, in the geopolitical contest with Russia and China and the West, there is now a big move toward friendshoring, uh, diversifying supply chains, building more regional resilience of supply chains. And you might think of South Asia being an opportunity uh, to, to benefit from this. And we've seen Apple, for example, moving some of its iPhone production uh, to the subcontinent. And so I wonder, Mustafa Zir, like, when you think of this issue, you're an expert in globalization. Is the region positioned to benefit from this macro shift in supply chain design? Or what would it need to do to benefit from this change? Oh, thank you, Raj. I think you have touched upon a very important uh, issue. As uh, we go forward, I think that's the way to, to, to strategize and re-strategize. Uh, because South Asia, in fact, has remained one of the most disjointed and delinked countries so far. But uh, in recent times, we have seen that there are movements with regard to deepening our uh, transport connectivities, I think, which can provide us a good opportunity to create uh, value chains and production networks. Uh, you perhaps know that the South Asian, four South Asian countries have signed a motor vehicle agreement. Uh, BBIN, Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Nepal. Uh, Bangladesh has uh, been uh, implementing a lot of uh, infrastructure uh, connectivity projects under the uh, three lines of credit provided by, by India. 
So I think that uh, that this creates an opportunity for multimodal connectivity, which is also very important in terms of attracting investment. I, re I recall that the World Bank uh, report, uh, 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 the glass half full, mentioned that exporting from Dhaka to Kathmandu was 1.5 times more than exporting from Dhaka to Sao Paulo. So we will have to... Uh, you know, do uh, the the infrastructure and logistics uh, connectivity, and if we can triangulate uh, trade connectivity, in investment connectivity, and transport connectivity, then I think the near shoring that you are mentioning about and attracting uh, FDI from uh, from outside, uh, not only for the global market but also South Asia is a big market, and we are also in the region of uh, ASEAN and, and also Southeast Asia. Bangladesh only exposed 12% of its global export to South Asia, East Asia, and, 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 and ASEAN countries, uh, although it imports uh, two-thirds from, from, from this region. So I think that uh, there is a, now a growing opportunity for, for production networks and value chains. Bangladesh's uh, export is 85% is ready-made garments. And there we have benefited from the value chains from, for example, you know, importing cotton, yarn, fabrics from India and then value adding and exporting to the, uh, to the developed country of uh, North America and, and Europe. So, but, but I think there are a number of uh, initiatives and, uh, and measures and reforms that we'll have to do. Francisca mentioned about the South Asia being very you know protective i think that that is uh, one we have fiscal reasons for that but uh, i think uh, domestic resource mobilization through direct taxation has become very important uh, because uh, high tariffs and protections uh, are are creating uh, problems for not only consumers but also producers and export oriented entrepreneurs but let me just also add uh, one point that uh, that while we do, uh, you know, um, understand the importance of opening up. I think with respect to some of the products in the developed country markets also, the, the, the tariffs are very high. Uh, the tariffs on, 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 on ready-made garments in European Union is 12%. The, the tariffs on, on, on the ready-made garments that we export to the United States and Canada, it's uh, 18%. So because we are LDC till now, we, we don't feel it because in many countries we get zero tariff access. But beyond 2026, when Bangladesh graduates from, uh, from, from, from the LDC group, we will uh, lose the preferential treatment. So I think that that part uh, also uh, should be kept in mind. Uh, but but I, I, I agree fully with your main hypothesis and what uh, our uh, fire said uh, you know, uh, chat also also mentioned and 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 also Francisca that we need to uh, open up. Uh, I think uh, our reforms in, in in tariffs and trade liberalization have slowed down. And the second, uh, the other point is that we do have many you know investment friendly policies. But uh, but I think that uh, cost of doing business, uh, one stop service for the investors. So those type of implementation capacities. Is, is very important. So state effectiveness is becoming very important in terms of attracting the uh, FDI, both for the regional markets and also for the global market. That's a very interesting way to put it. It is about state effectiveness. When you have a global market, companies and investors can go anywhere. Uh, they're looking to governments that have policies that are effective. And you also put an interesting point on the table, which is it's not just about global trade. Really, it starts in the region. And it's a big region. And if trade between the countries of South Asia isn't smooth, isn't easy, if the barriers are too high, then how can you expect to change the, the global picture and become kind of a, a, a go-to source for nearshoring and offshoring? Uh, Dushni, I'd love to get your take because you sit on the board of investment in Sri Lanka. And I wonder, do you also think when you have conversations about how to increase investment in that country, do you think about these same issues that uh, we just heard from Mustafa Zir, like how, how do you increase trade within the region first and, and reduce those barriers for entrepreneurs and, and businesses? I, I think that, uh, you know, discussions on um, investment, what is guiding trade flows, what is guiding investment 
flows. That that landscape has changed. If we just uh, simply look at um, trade, I mean, trade has become a battleground, uh, and all the rules, old rules and disciplines are being thrown out of the window. We are having export bans being imposed, import bans being imposed. Even FDI flows are being channeled to you know countries closer to home uh, that are considered to be friendly. Uh, so a lot of geopolitics now um, drive trade and um, FDI flows, and and you know advanced economies. If you look at the volume of subsidies and other tax credits that they are channeling um, to their domestic economies to expand um, capacity as well as to secure their supply chains in 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 uh, uh, crucial sectors. Now, developing countries and 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 in this region in South Asia particularly. Um, we the governments don't necessarily have the uh, fiscal resources to um, do uh, all of that. So in in some sense, I think the um, global you know uh, playing field is is again tilting against us. Um, we were in told many times, don't uh, export subsidies and all of these things should be um, halted. We must focus on improving our. Um, macroeconomic fund fundamentals to attract uh, FDI, et cetera. Now, I would still imagine that policy consistency and uh, political stability would be the key sort of um, factors that investors will look for if they are entering a, a, a country. Uh, and if you really don't have that basis on from which to launch your any efforts to attract investment, uh, it's going to be an uphill battle. But aside from that, um, and this has been somewhat of Sri Lanka's experience as well, I think trade agreements have also um, played a critical role. If you look at Sri Lanka's um, bilateral FTA with India, and that was confined to goods, but we benefited mostly on the investment uh, side because I think Indian investors felt there was some um, accord and agreement, um, dispute settlement mechanisms were built into it. There was, uh, you know, consultative mechanisms in there, uh, and and what we saw really was that that generated a significant inflow of FDI um, into Sri Lanka from India. So trade agreements and Sri Lanka is doing that. We are, you know, looking at various um, bilateral FTAs as well as uh, regional FTAs, would could be sort of a, a important bridging measure right now um, to try and link. Um, uh, efforts to attract uh, investment into uh, countries and, and especially countries like ours, um, mine, that's uh, struggling on the macro front to convince investors that, you know, the economic outlook um, is, is, is um, stable and, and will improve over time. So, you know, various measures are out there, but I would still say that policy and political stability is still what investors are looking for rather than uh, tax credits and tax holidays. We've rolled those out in the past and they've not really uh, worked as, as we would have expected them to. Yeah, interesting point yeah. you're putting on the table, right? That that you first have to think about the basic kind of the ante. You, you have to start with political stability. You have to start with some basic policy framework that investors can feel is safe, like dispute resolution. But that's also in the context, as you say, of advanced economies doing significant subsidies on strategic industries, including countries that long said they're against industrial policy are all doing that now. So it is a very different macro picture that, that you're facing. Um, we want to get into a couple of more issues here. In particular, I'd like to discuss sort of the fiscal picture that countries are facing. And so maybe you can go quickly back to you, Dishni, but we'll go quick, more quickly so we can get to all of these questions and issues. You know, your, Sri Lanka suffered a debt default last year. Um, it's not the only country in the region that has significant debt distress. What What is your advice or lesson maybe that you've learned from the situation in Sri Lanka that could be applied to other countries that are facing a significant debt challenge? Uh, I think one thing is um, to, if you are forced to restructure, then preemptive restructuring, I think, is always uh, uh, the preferred option. Um, and having defaulted, I think, you know, the, the space in which to maneuver um, is, is very tight. And, and there is somewhat of a tension I see that in, in the sense that governments want to do a deal quickly and, and understandable because the more prolonged their negotiations are, the 
the bigger your the impact uh, on the output contraction. And even for creditors, I think they would rather get their money early uh, rather than later. So in that um, sort of, uh, you know, there's a trade-off. In, in if you conclude negotiations uh, swiftly, uh, you might not really go into a deep restructuring um, in the sense of, you know, demanding much larger haircuts as a result of which uh, the risks are there and and, 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 the, and your report points that out very clearly that, you know, countries may again in two to three years um, uh, default once again and become serial defaulters. Now, for I'm going through this exercise here for Sri Lanka. I think what I would say are there are two things that we need to do. One is within the control of um, national governments, and that is to ensure that there are strong institutional structures in place to manage debt, set up independent debt management office, build capacity to analyze debt sustainability, do all of that groundwork. The second is on the global multilateral front, um, where I feel that the lack of a, a, a framework for debt restructuring, and, and, and Sri Lanka feels it particularly as a middle-income country, we don't qualify for the G20 framework. So getting all of these diverse creditors, and it's a very complex set of creditors that we have, for instance, uh, bilaterals, China, Japan, India, and, and bondholders, uh, on the other hand, uh, together, the uncertainty itself, um, I think, creates so much negativity on, on your economic outlook that recovery then gets hampered uh, even more so than uh, earlier. So, you know, World Bank, ADB, IMF, the multilaterals have to come together uh, with the major bilateral creditors, um, including China, to resolve this because, um, you know, the, the debt pile up and means that uh, Sri Lanka isn't going to be um, one of the last countries to get into trouble. There will be many more emerging market economies that will follow. There are, and it's a really <laughs> important point. And, and yet another example of where the geopolitical picture is affecting what might seem like very domestic situations, because as you say, a country like Sri Lanka suddenly finds itself caught because there is no framework, and there is no framework in part because there's a geopolitical contest over how to resolve these issues. So it is not an easy thing for any individual country like Sri Lanka to address, especially when you're in a moment of a fiscal crisis. Uh, Francisco, what do you think countries should do? I know you talk about this in the report, countries that are finding themselves in a very unsustainable debt picture. What, what are some of the steps they ought to take? Yeah, thank you. Um, just to put a number on what Dushni said before, this region stands out. This region has 86% of GDP in government debt and it's much more than any other region. And it has a revenue ratio of 18% of GDP on average compared to 30% of GDP in other emerging markets or the emerging market average as a whole. So, it's so it really more, has- But it's not raising as much tax as other countries are to pay back debt. Exactly. So this is, it does stand out in its, uh, in its fiscal problems. Now, what, like Dushni said, that defaults are really difficult to make them work. It's surprising how few of them don't even achieve the most basic objective to improve debt positions. Actually, we showed that one third, more than one third of defaults never achieve what they're meant to do. They don't reduce debt five years later or they don't reduce borrowing cost five years later. So it's really difficult to make a default work. The defaults that did work in that sense, at least restoring fiscal positions a bit, it are those that came with growth accelerations, fiscal consolidation, and Dushni already touched on this, the ones for the external debt defaults, the ones that had above median debt restructuring. So debt restructuring is really critical, but it will have to come with domestic fiscal consolidation. And there, you, debt management, debt transparency can help bring down borrowing costs, but it's unlikely to really reduce the financing requirement. So it's back to basics. It's raising revenues. <laughs> we just spoke about this. It's improving spending, spending efficiency as well. Now, on raising revenues, it's incredibly difficult to achieve because it means getting more people into a tax, bed, a tax net. And most of the time, it's a matter of broadening the tax base. Not so much raising rates, but broadening the tax base, bringing more people in and enforcing. It's also a very difficult thing for, to do for governments if they don't have a pre-built capacity already. On the spending side, there are some easy wins, but there are much more difficult wins too. 
so one well, at least economically easier win, maybe not politically easier win, is to remove subsidies. In the region, despite some reforms, as subsidy, energy subsidies still account for one and a half to two percent of GDP. Fiscally costly and distortive. So really, it's a win-win to remove them. The problem is, of course, the political uh, implications of this. So it has to be accompanied by reforms that then support the vulnerable groups. And they're easier to um, remove when energy prices are low, which is not the case right now. Exactly. Yeah. And the final point is that a lot of countries have found it useful to use fiscal rules exactly to force these reforms on the revenue side and on the spending side. The problem is, and four of the countries in the region actually have fiscal rules. Sri Lanka is one of them, India is another one of them, Pakistan is another one of them. The problem is fiscal rules not equal to fiscal rule. The, the fiscal rules in the region are actually all on the softer side. But it's the stronger, the more enforced ones that are associated with slower uh, debt buildups. So three dimensions where things can be improved, revenues, expenditure, and the structure, the, the institutional arrangements for the fiscal accounts. What, what do you think about this, Mustafa Zir? I'd love to know the situation in Bangladesh because I think of Bangladesh as one of the success stories of the region. It's had a lot of growth. You mentioned it's no longer going to be a at uh, least a lower developed country, it'll move to middle income status in 2026. Um, but yet there may be a debt challenge there as well. How do you see the picture there? What, what does the country need to do? Yes, Raj, that's a very raw nerve that you have touched. Uh, it's true uh, that Bangladesh success story has been you know, very well documented. But uh, right now, as we speak, we are under uh, significant macroeconomic stress. Uh, Francisca mentioned about 18% and uh, I think 30, 30%. Bangladesh's revenue GDP ratio is less than 10%. And if you add on 5% of uh, fiscal deficit, you can only spend 15% of GDP. So it's, it's a major problem. And, uh, and two thirds of the revenue comes from the indirect taxes. So it is also inequalizing. So I think that uh, Francisca rightly mentioned and uh, Dushni mentioned about proactive policies. I think we have been very reactive. You know, for, for example, uh, exchange rate of uh, Taka, it has depreciated over the last one and a half uh, years from 88 to 110. You see, so what type of you know, inflationary, imported inflationary pressure that the country is, is now facing? With regard to also debt, you know, our total debt to GDP ratio is only 32%. Foreign uh, debt is uh, 12% and domestic debt is 20%. So it's less than the 55% IMF uh, threshold. But but then it is it is rising at a fast pace. And uh, uh, because of the Ukraine-Russia war and also our own uh, you know, uh, ma monetary policies, uh, our uh, reserves have come down from $48 billion to, according to IMF estimates, $21 billion. From 48 to 21 over a period of one and a half of years. So debt repayment, which was not an issue in Bangladesh, is, is increasingly becoming an issue. And because we have made the transition from low-income country to lower-middle-income country in 2015, according to World Bank, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, category, uh, we are also not getting non-concessional, uh, 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 you know, concessional loans. So loans are becoming highly, uh, you know, the interest rates are very high. Today, I was looking at the uh, statement by, by the World Bank that, that, that they will give Bangladesh debt, but it will be about 5%. Now, the IDA loan was 0.75%. So you see the, 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 the conditions are becoming stringent. So I very much agree with, uh, with Dushni that one will have to be proactive. We just should not uh, really you know, react uh, when, when things are coming. So I think that one is domestic mobilization. And I think here digital technology can be, uh, can be very good uh, you know, tool in order to broaden uh, the, the tax net and, and also bring direct taxation under the tax net. So the, this is uh, one. The other is obviously to take the reforms. For example, we have for a long time, we have not depreciated the Taka. We thought that imported inflation will come, but now uh, we have to de depreciate you know, from 88 to 110 when the global prices are, have also gone up. So, so double win. 
so i think that uh, that debt uh, sustainability will become uh, a problem even for a country like bangladesh and i think i agree with uh, uh, dushni that uh, that we need to also think about whether you know global debt uh, you know restructuring and and those type of initiatives um, will be becoming uh, very important mm. and of course any time there's a debt circumstance the the sooner you start addressing it the easier it is to address and i wonder if the same thing can apply to the green transition uh, you know that we know this transition will take place the question is how long is that time frame before countries like bangladesh start to make that shift we have very little time left so kind of your last uh, comment here was to i'd like to get your yeah. take on the opportunity for a country like bangladesh which is big in you know ready made garments light uh, you know low skill manufacturing what's the opportunity to transition for bangladesh i i i would like to appreciate the south asia development update because they have brought this very important issue and for bangladesh it is becoming crucially important because as we graduate from the ldc group and don't get preferential treatment you know the the conditionalities and 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 the demands of green uh, production uh, carbon uh, content carbon emission etc are becoming very important on the side of uh, our our development partners and for market access uh, um, in, in 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 developed country markets so uh, we are taking some uh, some step uh, bangladesh is committed to um uh, you know transiting to to green industry as distinct from green technology because we are still far from there but at least you know decarbonizing and uh, for example plastics and for example ready made garments 85% of our export they are if you look at the need to add sector most of the uh, the world's lead certification uh, uh, need to add factories are in bangladesh you know platinum uh, um, you know uh, certification as well so this is a, a very important we need to incentivize it Uh, there should be tra- technology t- uh, transfer when uh, we f- uh, hear from the entrepreneurs that uh, that when they invest for for green technology and green production they don't get the you know money <laughs> that that they thought they would be getting from the major mm-hmm. buyers so i think that there should be also from not only from our supply side but also some some thought uh, from the demand side as well Thank you. Yeah, we just have a couple of minutes left, but I want to get back to this issue Dushni that that I mentioned earlier and that Anantha brought up, which is about what the transition to green means for the labor force. Because while it might create many new jobs, it does suggest there could be a transition. There's lots of workers in the region whose jobs are tied to, you know, more carbon intensive industries. Give us in just a minute, what do you think is the picture around the labor force transition that's required? I think South Asia um faces uh, two key challenges one is that you know informality um in South Asian labor market is extremely high that means they are not getting social protection but most importantly they are not even getting retraining uh and uh, the education sector also is not geared to upskilling um the workforce as as required so this i think it can't be looked at in um, silos or in isolation the labor market reforms and education sector reforms have to come together to uh, bridge this uh, transition and 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 more high skill sort of workers moving into green um, financing reforms again i mentioned before we discussed it and know what to do is matter of the political will to go to ahead and implement them thank you i i just <laughs> I want to turn to Francisca if I can to kind of close out our conversation today um because we have heard a lot about the challenges rightly we focused a lot on them but it does seem that there is an opportunity and Ananta talked about it in India where you can reduce the informality that Dishni just described through digital Mustafa Zia talked about through digital you can increase maybe revenue collection that there is this green transition which could create new opportunities for investment and you talked about Francisca new uh new savings that firms can use to invest in growth and new jobs so it does seem like with all the challenges there is a path forward where the green transition could be a benefit maybe you can just describe that a little more as we close out our conversation this morning yeah thank you dad it could indeed and there are things that even cash strapped governments can do 
So we elaborate some of these in the, in, in the report. And really, there, there are four elements of this. One is market-based regulation. It really, it, it, we've reviewed every study we could find into a meta, into a regression, into a literature review. Really, regulation works, especially if it's market-based. If it's not market-based, it has side effects, it, reduces, it causes economic pain. But if it's market-based, if it sets a price on emissions or on, uh, on pollution, it, it tends to work without the pain. Second is access to finance. Firms always complain about it. Uh, there's more and more evidence that giving firms access to finance they is actually invested in new technologies that improve productivity and efficiency. Third is um, just a reliable power grid. If you don't give firms a reliable power grid, they're not going to get rid of those generators that are dirty and energy inefficient. Big one. And fourth is something that brings me back to what Mustafa Zio said. For how can you get these firms to uh, adopt these technologies? And there we've done a beautiful experiment in Bangladesh in the textile, leather textile industry, actually, that shows if you just install a meter and a better motor in a few firms, not all of them, just a few firms, firms cotton on very quickly to, the, to technologies that are, that are useful. So you see the energy savings, 80% in our experiment, when firms only expected 30%. And you see all of the firms, not just the ones who got the motor under the, the, the meter, all of the firms start adopting, within three months, they start adopting this new technology because word spreads. When there's a new technology that works, that's worth the cost, word spreads and new technologies will be adopted. So those are the kinds of opportunities that need to be facilitated by governments. Yeah, that's fantastic. Thank you for ending us on a, on a positive note of what's possible. And in the same way word spreads there, I think word is spreading about South Asia and its growth story. And the key question that you in this report, Francisca, at this important report highlight for the world is, can that growth continue? Will this be a story we're talking about a decade from now? Or will it be a short blip in economic history? And the difference between those two stories is really whether or not the ideas that were brought up in this panel conversation today come to fruition. There are huge opportunities, but huge challenges too. So I, I recommend the report to anyone who's interested in this theme. Um, I think it will really outline a lot of what you've heard today in greater depth. And if you wanna join the discussion, there's a conversation happening on Twitter or X. You can go to the hashtag South Asia Development to learn a bit more. It's been a real pleasure to be with all of you. These are topics we at DevX are covering all the time. And so we appreciate the chance to be with all of you today. Thank you. Uh, to my panelists, thank you for everyone for joining the conversation. Thank you, Rad. Thank you, Francisca. Thank you, Dushni. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.